Paul wrote to the Corinthians saying, The old way with its laws etched in stone led to death, though it began with such glory that people could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way which brings condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? So the law of Moses was an old way that faded, was set aside and was replaced with a new way that will remain forever. What is this new way? It could be called the law of Christ and when it started, the law of Moses ended. Jesus introduced his law in the Sermon of the Mount, which is universally recognized as the most sublime moral teaching ever given. And when we examine this sermon, we find Jesus strongly emphasizing that he's not looking for a change in outward behavior. He's looking for a change of heart. He tells the people, You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Likewise, he goes on to say, You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is emphasizing inner change. He's judging motives. He's looking at what's going on in the heart. Remember, he came to heal the heart sickness, which was always the core of the problem. When Jesus used this method of contrasting his own teaching with the teaching of the Old Commandments, he was illustrating that the teaching of the Ten Commandments were actually morally inferior. For example, under the Ten Commandments, someone could foster a deep hatred for a foreigner and fantasize about killing him, but as long as he didn't act on the thought and commit the murder, he technically wasn't breaking the law. The Sixth Commandment only judged the action, not the thought. This allowed for duplicitness of heart and inner moral decay to set in. It allowed for people to become unwashed cups and whitewashed tombs like the Pharisees, seemingly good on the outside but full of hate and anger on the inside, without strictly breaking the law. It also meant that people who fostered hatred could sabotage someone's reputation or, in a sense, murder their character without strictly breaking the law again. The law of Christ changed all that and said, I don't just want new actions, I want new people, I want new hearts. Jesus said this knowing that new external actions would automatically follow from newly renovated hearts. So apart from anything else, people who insist on clinging to the Ten Commandments are clinging to an inferior moral code than those who have gone on to accept and live by the words of Christ. We can go on with similar examples of how the Ten Commandments were actually morally inferior. The Law of Moses had just said to love your neighbour. This allowed the Jews to hate their enemies. The Law of Christ goes further though and says to love enemies as well. You may remember Jesus trying to get this point across with the story of the Good Samaritan. The Law of Moses had said that you can divorce one another with just a written note. The law of Christ goes further though and says that there are only a very small number of specific circumstances when divorce is allowed at all. Indeed, the whole of the New Testament is full of instruction which comes out of the law of Christ. By the ending of the old system, we have not been left with no instruction at all. And of course, it would do anyone well to study the word of God diligently to find out what it is and to let it soak into their hearts. At the end of his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus then gives a simple command that sums up everything he wants to say. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the Law and the Prophets. Later in his ministry, he repeats, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. He says it again. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. And here it is again. 
So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Later on, John would write, And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with them. So these verses tell us that if we obey this commandment, we will remain in his love, fulfill everything God asks of us, prove to the world that we are his, and interestingly, it says following this command will fill us with joy. You may notice a real lack of joy in legalists. So here is the commandment or law of Christ. Have faith in Christ, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love others as yourself. And that's all. Faith and love. It really can't get much simpler. Think about it and you'll see the genius of this. If you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, you won't worship any other gods or turn away from him or blaspheme his name or do anything to contradict or disobey him. And if you love others as yourself, you won't murder them, steal from them, lie to them, injure them, be jealous of them, or commit adultery. In fact, you won't even foster those thoughts in your hearts. So by following the law of Christ, you will automatically fulfill the moral law and you'll do it in a much deeper way than the Ten Commandments ever did. Love, therefore, is the key. The Apostle Paul writes, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbour, you will fulfil the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say, You must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfils the requirements of God's law. In his letter to the Galatians, he also writes, The whole law can be summed up by this one command, Love your neighbour as yourself. James refers to this new law as the royal law, saying, Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus didn't leave us with no law at all. He simply gave us a better one, a simpler one. Put your faith in Christ for salvation and love God and love one another.